You're listening to the Moose and the Loose, your 10 minutes action packed financial podcast with your host, Mikey Hu. Hey, what's up, Market Moose? Mike from the Moose on the Loose. I hope you are doing well today. Welcome to this Thursday uh, podcast. Sorry, I was about to say video. I don't know why. Um, portfolio review for Q2. So after um, six months, well, actually five months in, five full months in, where do I stand with my pension plan portfolio? which kind of like move I'm thinking of doing at this point and um, with like what my performance are look like. So we're going to start with the performance. Uh, keep in mind, five months doesn't mean much, but just in, it's always an interesting to see how it goes. So of course, since the beginning of the year, we still have a lot of uncertainties. We uh, still wonder what's going to happen with interest rate over the long run, if inflation is really under control or not, um, if it's going to impact the economy, especially in, in Canada, where we have several indicators starting to tell us that the economy is slowing down, it's not doing that great. So all of this... And yet the market is up. Kind of crazy, right? So the um, the TSX, um, I look at the XYU uh, total return um, as of recording this podcast, beginning of June, was up 6.6%. So that includes the stock price appreciation plus the dividend up 6.6. The S&P 500, I use SPY, so classic spider S&P 500 ETF. This one is up 11.3%. So I use those two um, ETFs as my benchmark. So I want to see how I'm doing versus the market. Since my portfolio was started started as 50% Canadian, 50% US, I'm, I'm using just quick calculation here. And of course, it's not... I could be like a lot more precise or I could track a lot of trades and then make sure that the percentage are exact. But really... What I want to know here is having a pretty good idea of what I'm, how am I doing versus the market because the whole point is while I do enjoy investing in managing my portfolio, I don't want to hurt my returns for a wide margin. So I just want to make sure that I'm aligned with the market. If I can beat it, it's even better, which has been the case um, since I've been publicly reporting this this uh, pension income since 2017. And for the rest of my assets, it has been also the case since 2003. But even if I was just behind by 1% analyzed return, let's say over 20 years, I would still be super happy because what is important for me is not necessarily just to beat the market, but most importantly is to have high conviction in my portfolio. So then I never panic. I'm always comfortable. I always sleep well at night and I never start wondering what should I do? Like what's, where's the economy go? And, and it's kind of funny. I had that discussion with, with someone the other day and he's like, yeah, what's your forecast for the next three months? And I'm like, dude, I don't care about the next three months. It's it's completely irrelevant. And just to prove that to you, can you tell me a little bit more about uh, March, April, and May of 2017? Like what happened to your portfolio during March, April, and May of 2017? I know that you cannot do that without looking back, but just by by like remembering it's almost impossible, right? And I don't know either. Why? Because it's not relevant. I can tell you, I can remember when the market crashed, how it in fact impacted my portfolio. I can tell you about my total returns since the beginning of my investment period. But over the past three months, the next three months, what's going to happen? Completely irrelevant. But yet, I just want to be fully transparent. So the average of my benchmark to go back here, so SPY 11.3, XYU 6.6, so the average should be 9%, so half and half. On my side, I started the year at $239,000 and now I'm at $255,000, so for a growth of 6.4. That, of course, includes dividend, and since uh, this account is in a lira, I cannot add capital, so that 6.4 is all I got for that period. Uh, not bad. Not bad considering the... Um, current market, but of course, worse than what the market offered. Uh, 
At this stage, I'm not really worried because it's not a big difference. And I know that I'm not as invested into tech stock as the S&P 500. So I'm not too far behind XYU. And clearly a big chunk of the S&P 500 right now is driven by technology stock and the Magnificent 7. So I'm not worried overall about my performance at this point. So what I did instead is I went on my DSR Pro dashboard to look at my first, my sector allocation. So sector allocation, I see that my two largest sectors are financials at 30%, uh, and tech stocks at 20. So 30% for financial is definitely a lot of money, but then my first reflex is to look at what's inside the financial sector. So if I have like for 30% of Canadian banks, that would be bad because that would mean that I just add a lot of salt to my soup. And if there's a mortgage crisis, well, I have 30% of my portfolio get, that is going to get smacked. So instead, I looked at my position and then I discovered that, oh, I have Brookfield Corporation. Brookfield Corporation is an alternative asset manager, well diversified across multiple investment opportunities with a long-term capital mindset. So not a bank, that's good. Then another position I have is Visa. It's a payment processor and it's like one-third technology, one-third financial and one-third consumer discretionary. So again, all good on this one. Pretty happy to have it. Then I have BlackRock. So BlackRock, another asset manager, but while Brookfield Corporation is an alternative asset manager, meaning that it doesn't invest in equities on the stock market, but rather into large, less liquid long-term projects, while BlackRock is totally the opposite. It focuses a lot more on the equity market, the fixed income, um, they offer ETFs. So that is also a good way of diversifying my portfolio. And finally, the last two positions are Canadian banks, so Royal Bank and national banks that is closing that 30%. So overall, I have exposure to three different industries and inside those, they are still well diversified as BlackRock and Brookfield does not have the right, that do, don't have the same business model. So after that, I'm all good, not, ex not overexposed by more than 20% in other sectors. So that's fine. In terms of weight, uh, my Microsoft position is a bit overweight at 10% right now in my portfolio, but since I have other assets, when I look at my global view, Microsoft goes down to 5.73%, so not that much. My largest holding right now is Apple at 9% across all my holdings. Then I have Kushtar at 8%, so I can live with those two winners. It's all good. So I did actually one small modification and it was that I decided to get rid of Magna International. You know, at the beginning of the uh, of the week, I told you about the rockstar list. I told you about focusing on dividend growth, on strong dividend triangle. And yesterday I told you my tricks to sell stocks at the right time. And one of them was to ensure that your investment thesis is aligned with numbers, with financial metrics, because it's a one thing to have a story, but if you cannot back your story with facts, well, you don't get, you don't have much. And for Magna International, the narratives is still very seductive. I mean, it's a great company with um, sticky business model, making business with all the big important car makers. They're making so, different, so, so many different car parts. They could build their own model and, and it's just amazing. But revenues are growing. Earnings have been shaky since 2019. The dividend has slowed down over the past two years. So now it's time to unfortunately let this one go. Even though I believe that the narrative is still strong, I want to focus on something that is a little bit better. But for this one, you'll have to wait. I'm not going to share my buy because I'm, I'm a bit running late on this one. But that's the only move I made on this uh, in this quarter. Typically, I don't even trade necessarily once a quarter. I trade maybe like one or twice a year. Uh, last trades that happened was just to reallocate money and to trim. So basically just to rebalance. So it's been a while since I sell one of my investment, but Magna International now is part of that loop. Um, st I still believe it's a great company, but at one point I need to follow my process, which is a lot more important than what I believe as a person, as an investor. And my 
process has proven me multiple times that I'm doing the right thing. So when in doubt, I follow my process. It makes my life a lot easier. All right, Moose, that's enough for today. And tomorrow I will talk about a <laughs> juicy problem I had with my webinar. So last year, last week we had a webinar, we had a bunch of problems. So I'm going to tell you about it and I tell you about the life as an entrepreneur. But if you want to watch the webinar in the meantime, you can go at moosemarkets.com slash webinar. There's a free replay over there and I'm sure you're going to enjoy. All right, Moose, stay good care. And until tomorrow, don't forget to stay invested. Hey, welcome to Disclaimer. If you're listening to The Moose and the Loose, you cannot really expect me to give you buy or sell recommendation or financial advice, right? You're here for fun, you're here for information and some entertainment. But I am not your financial advisor, I am not your broker, so therefore I'm not liable if you're losing money after listening to the podcast. If you're looking for some advice, go see a professional. If not, you can enjoy the show and do your due diligence after it.